Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're looking at a period in history that has great resonance today with special guests, Rabbi Ellie Meyerfeld, a CEO of the Holocaust Memorial Center of Michigan, Dr. Guy Stern, former interim director of the center, scholar of German languages and culture, former U.S. Army Ritchie boy who saw service during World War II, having escaped to the United States as a refugee for Nazi Germany, and Dr. Mirjam Wenzel, director of the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt, Germany. I'm so happy that you're here. Dr. Stern, I'm going to go to you. I'm going to set this up simply by noting 1930s Nazism was enabled by extensive use of the big lie propaganda technique. And the technique is to tell colossal lies and spread fears in ways that dominate chatter in public spaces with these lies functioning as a rallying cry for movement politics. In 1930s Germany, the result was the Nazi political apparatus and people were urged to turn to one leader able to, to fix everything. And they did just that. So disinformation techniques are alive and well in different areas of the world today. So I'd like to start uh, the conversation with you, Dr. Stern. You and your family were demonized as Jews. You escaped to, a, to America as a refugee, served in U.S. Army intelligence. And I just asserted that the big lie technique is still being used today. So could you just comment on your own life experience as someone who lived through that era and it, are, are you seeing resonance in terms of, of our history and, and our shared history? And we'll, we'll go through a little bit of that. And what is going on today in terms of, in terms of how this technique uh, also finds purchase today? Yes. Uh, I, I think it starts with Hitler's insight that propaganda was a major tool in the, in the road to dictatorship. He had the uh, curious and pernicious vision, vision to institute a cabinet post, and that's unprecedented in any history, certain, in German history, certainly, of putting a cabinet post for enlightening of the people and for propaganda. So that was, he saw it as a weapon from the start. And Goebbels proved to be a master at it. You have already given some of his guidelines set to himself uh, oh, in saying that a lie repeated often enough will become credible. And uh, that was one of them. Or that he used the propaganda of the leader. A sort of, uh, I, I, would, I would say, by uh, making the leader almost like a prophet or a religious figure. And that was done, as uh, some books have shown, by the uh, employment of German propaganda, every German vocabulary taken from the New Testament, also some from the Old Testament, I might add. And uh, then, uh, so the leader is being mystified and made saint-like a cult of personality. And uh, you can find many details of their technique. If you look at the writings of Goebbels, they were all published. And what you find in it, uh, that, for, uh, that, for example, this uh, saintly behavior, is put out by saying Hitler was a total, uh, was totally off alcohol. It was said that he was a, uh, that he took no salary for his uh, leadership post. Of course, uh, that is, uh, that was a ruse 
because he sold that book. Every newlywed couple got a present of Mein Kampf. And of course, Hitler collected the royalties. Uh, the, uh, another example was, as I said, the, the, the vocabulary taken from the New Testament of, uh, that uh, seeped over into the German vocabulary. So uh, in uh, over, one of time, the- over time, what you end up with is this concentration of, of virtue, of the person is making great sacrifices financially. Um, it's the only person who can fix things. It's this sort of concentration of, of this cult of personality. There are symbols in this particular case, the, the Hockenkreutz, the, the Nazi symbol, the red, the, the, um, the, the very um, uh, repetition of media. Today we have podcasts, then it was black and white film. Dr. Wenzel, as you seek to expose this history and, and how, um, in this particular case, Jews were used as a, as a tool, as one of those um, those elements that were just sort of used as a way to create a flashpoint. How yes. do you, Dr. Wenzel, use your museum, which is located in the Rothschild House, to counter this type of activity? Because it's 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 recurring in the United States. It's recurring in Hungary. It's recurring in Germany. It's recurring all over the world. How do you use your museum, Dr. Wenzel, to expose this type of act? Well, first of all, you know, the the big lie is something that was attributed by Hitler to the Jews. Um, In his book, Mein Kampf, he was attributing to the Jews that they were using the big lie um, as a kind of the conspiracy mood that he, you know, um, that he was using uh, for getting into power. So it was um, attributed by him to, to Jews. And so the question how to fight anti-Semitism and those kind of conspiracy theory is a very actual question for us. And um, our approach is we say we are now, and that's how we face history. For us, history is not the past. History is something that needs to be retold and and commemorated. So there's something very alive in in the echoes of history. Germany is a post-genocidal society. And the echoes of the genocide are different in the families. In Jewish families, they are totally different than in German families, where the echoes have much more to do with the fact that things were suppressed and not told to the children and um, that there is a kind of refusal to deal with, with certain feelings of guilt. And those feelings are attributed to Jews then again. So, um, so that's our starting point is pretty much from today. We are looking at the conflicts of today of a society that is highly polarized or more and more polarized, that is much and much more now a society of a diverse society, a society where it's, where 25% don't have a background of where the parents and grandparents came from Germany. So they also need to find an approach to what's happened. And, and what we do is we tell history and personal stories. So um, we tell what happened and it's very important for us that people understand the dimension um, of what happens um, for everybody's life. And so, so that's our approach. And, um, and we don't only focus on the years of 33 to 45, but also to this big, glorious time of German Jewry, especially here in Frankfurt, which was the town with the highest percentage of Jewish population in the whole uh, German Reich. So, so this glorious Jewish story of, of, uh, or history of, of Frankfurt is important for us to tell as well. And, and we would also like to tell it not only from you know, how we see it today in what happened during Nazi times, but also in its own right and its own potential and um, its own beauty. Dr. Stern, I'm going to come to uh, uh, 
Ellie in a second, but, you know, Dr. Vinson made a very interesting point, this idea that these techniques in their new guise might be directed against Jews, yes, but could also be directed against people who are immigrants, who come from other places, from in, in the United States south of the border or in, in Europe um, from the east or from the Middle East uh, coming in as refugees. Do you see these same techniques being used to now target other people uh, other than Jews, uh, of people of Latin Hispanic um, uh, extraction? Yes. And uh, I, I'm uh, reminded by uh, Dr. Wenzel's remark <coughs> of a quote from Goebbels in, in volume three. Uh, and here he says, accuse your enemies of the crimes that you want to commit. And that is striking in, in the content of uh, that, what Dr. Wenzel said. And uh, uh, so there are some means we have to combat that, but is that maybe uh, something that you want to elicit first from another speaker? Well, um, Ali, it would be great to, to talk about um, how your museum is, which is in many respects, the embodiment of the leadership across the field, um, is, is working to uh, tell this story, reveal it in a way that is accessible to people who, uh, who have lived it, but also the young people who have not. As, as Dr. Wenzel said, there, there are huge numbers of people who have no connection personal to this, to this uh, um, uh, uh, part of our uh, uh, of our shared history, but your mission is to engage people in this discussion and, and make it relevant today. How do you approach that work? So um, I saw the survey pop up, so I'm just going to use this as an answer to that as well. There's a, a, a saying that doesn't we don't know who the author is. I think it's been a, a, a attributed to Mark Twain to Abraham Lincoln. We don't know who said it, but something along the lines of History doesn't repeat itself, but it does rhyme. And so I think that what we have to deal with at the museum is that we are bringing in people for whom this story could as well be something that happened, you know, before the American Civil War. These are uh, people for whom they have no direct connection to either the perpetration of the Holocaust or the suffering of the Holocaust. And so how do you reach across the generations and frankly, across the ocean? And one of the ways that we have found that's very successful is to connect the viewer, the visitor to the museum, to individual stories. And, you know, Dr. Wenzel was talking about that as well at the museum there. But it's to make sure that these pieces become relevant in the individual's lives. So talk about the, 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 uh, the, the kinds of experiences that a survivor had at the same age as the person who's visiting. A lot of them are school kids. So talk to them about, you know, Dr. Stern was... You know, young man when he was uh, dealing with the uh, situation of looking out his window and seeing Nazi marches outside his own living room window and connect it to them in a way that, that they hear the history of it. And then I want them to make the connection to their own lives. I, I can't force feed that to them. They need to be thinking about it. Sometimes when I talk to supporters of the museum, they, they wish that we could like get a can opener that just kind of opens up people's minds and inserts these ideas and poof, everybody thinks different. It doesn't work that way. So we have to expose them to these kinds of stories, to the experience, to facts. I'm not saying these are just stories in terms of, you know, one person's narrative. We want to connect them to a series of facts. They should understand what history teaches us about where these things can lead. And then they need to apply them in their own lives. So it is something that happened far away to someone not like them. But we have uh, survivor stories of people who lived in Michigan. These were their neighbors. They went to the same schools maybe 50 years ago but they went to the same schools. How do you connect them that way? And I think that's the answer to how you connect people across time and across distance. Well, to give an example, Dr. Venzo, could you talk a little bit about the beer hall push and what happened in Germany in, in that failed attempt to, uh, to take over the government? And, and then we, could, we should relate it to what happened just Less, uh, less than a year ago in the United States of that failed attempt. 
Uh, could you just remind us what the beer hall push was? Well, well that was Hitler's first attempt to, to get into power um, in Munich by marching through the Feldherrenhalle. And this push fa uh, uh, failed and he w was imprisoned. He, he wrote Mein Kampf. Uh, in there and later on when he got into power he was you know retelling the story of the whole push and um and that's actually also the background of then uh, the kristallnacht um so the pogrom happened exactly the same uh, a date um because they were marching the day before and so they could mo mobilize for the pogrom and so the attempt to to get into power needs a symbol and um um always needs a symbol and um, the main symbol that the Nazi power was using was the burning of the Reichstag. We know from history that they burned the Reichstag themselves. But, um, but of course, they accused somebody else. Um, and um, so these kind of, um, um, you know, symbols with, with a, a big life story behind it is part of the, the power techniques of, uh, of fascist, of fascist um, uh, takeovers. So um, it, as we look to, to today and, and try to uh, figure out how we triangulate between the past and the, and the future, and we have different targets, uh, one of the things that, that your book makes very clear, Dr. Stern, is that your experience as a refugee is it has resonance uh, here for uh, refugees who come to Germany and try to integrate into German society, try to get a job and try to make a, a living and make a contribution to German society or refugees that come to the United States and make a contribution. So we have a family connection, you and I, which we just discovered four weeks ago. And, and really, I, I discovered it um, or my family discovered it by looking at a 60 Minutes interview in which you mentioned that you were from Hildesheim. And my family is from Hildesheim, my grandparents. Could you just um, share with us what you wrote on page uh, 26 of your book and how that connection actually is, is intensely personal? Yes, with pleasure. <laughs> <laughs> what happened is my parents, with the help of a committee, had obtained a date for me with the American consul in Hamburg. So from Hildesheim, I had to get to Hamburg, the longest trip of my life. And as it happened, we heard through community talk that one day uh, prior to my appearance there, your grandparents were scheduled for the same purpose of getting a visa and an effort and, and uh, getting the necessary papers to immigrate, uh, immigrate. So my parents got in touch with your grandparents and said, could our young boy, I was 14 at the time, uh, could our young boy have a ride with you? They said, welcome aboard. And so I had one day's journey with your grandparents. And that was obviously the most important ride of my life because my very life depended on that outcome of that journey to the consul's office in Hamburg. I got it within 10 minutes. It was a document for which every youngster was, uh, of which every youngster was speaking. And uh, so, yes, that was uh, indeed uh, one of the highlights of my growing up period and beyond. And my, my grandfather had been arrested by the Gestapo. My grandmother, who was non-Jewish, was able to go to Berlin, where Jews were not allowed to go into offices that Jews were not allowed to go and petition for his release. And finally, 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 through great persistence, 
was able to get him out. And, and it was a matter of survival for our family to uh, get out of Germany at the same time. One of the things that I think is so wonderful, though, is that you have in your career, you've been able to help to forge uh, real understanding in your own studies of German culture and language and, and your connections uh, to Germany. Uh, you've been able to forge and be part of this post-war collaboration. Uh, we're also doing work for the Alexander von Humboldt uh, Stiftung, which is yes. the, uh, the largest fellowship, the most prominent fellowship for, for scholars uh, in Germany. Um, uh, Ellie, how do you see this, this relationship uh, born out of real tragedy and violence and um, the Holocaust, how do you see this relationship developing so that we together immunize ourselves from these kinds of, of issues? And Dr. Wenzel, I'd like to come to you and comment as well. Um, how do we proceed together in a way that, that brings understanding? So I'm, I'm looking at this survey and here we are on a, a Zoom presentation and being live streamed on YouTube and Facebook. And I would say a best piece of advice I'd give is to unplug, but I'm not sure how that works given that <laughs> we're doing this. <laughs> well, I, but I think that if we unplug, we leave the platforms to those people hmm. who, who have this. So I, I, I think we, yeah. we must engage in dialogue and that's really what you're all about. And, and that's Correct. the thing that I admire so much. It's the never ending battle to inform and to, to provide a much more complicated and textured truth than the simple lies that are, that are pushed out. So our museum had started outreach uh, a couple of years ago um, to teachers to help train teachers how to talk about the Holocaust in the classrooms and how to make those messages relevant. Um, and then through the pandemic, we had already started a, an effort to try and, and engage through social media before the pandemic. And obviously that became even more important during the pandemic as people couldn't come into the building. Um, and now that people are starting to come back in the building, we really want to continue to lean in on um, making sure those messages can be brought forward in a factual way um, and connect to people. You're right. We do have to provide a diet of, of truth and meaning um, to uh, combat a, a lot of the, the lies and distortions that exist on social media. So we have to fight it. You know, I think fire with fire. I don't think that there's a way to to, to tamp down those um, those those uh, voices that are are encouraging violence and and encouraging hatred, um, except by talking about the things that really matter and trying to engage people on those. It, it's a it's a real challenge. Do you provide um, exhibitions that go beyond the Holocaust and look at the Holocausts in Rwanda? Uh, Dr. Wenzel, look at the Holocausts that are happening in places like Syria. Um, look at the um, at the aftermath of war. Do you create those those kinds of connections so that people with all sorts of different experiences can see this multidimensionally? Well, those connections are really important for us because, as I said, like uh, Frankfurt is a very diverse town. Germany now is like twenty five percent people from all different backgrounds and um, they need to relate to a story that is not necessarily theirs and they need to understand what what responsibility for society means uh, in Germany with this history of the Holocaust and so how do you do that and you only do that when you listen to them and listen to their stories, their background, their migration stories, their discrimination experiences, and their genocidal experiences in some cases, you know? And, and, and so um, what, what we do is sometimes that we engage with um, students from different classes and make them develop, for instance, theater plays in our permanent exhibition and tell their story. And, and it was very touching. Recently, there was um, a, a young guy from Syria, and he was relating to the story of a Holocaust survivor. And actually, at that particular point, he told how he lost his own mother and what, what happened to him in Syria. And that was, you know, so touching in this, in this theater play that, you know, was played, I don't know, 10 times in our permanent um, exhibition. So, so we do a lot of reach out to, 
to um, students, particularly from, from backgrounds that don't necessarily go to the museums, and particularly not to Jewish museums, and make them discover stories in our permanent exhibition that are their stories or that they can relate to. And, and that's a very important task for us. And because I, I really think um, history is something very concrete. Memory is something very concrete. It, it, it's, only, um, it's only concrete when you practice it, when you talk about it, when it's personal. And um, it's so- It's um, right. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's, so, it's, it's so important because these, in many respects, Dr. Stern, these, um, these uh, museums are vehicles for carrying your memories and the memory of somebody who, is, who has lost their family in Syria. And there is, no, there is no tension amongst survivors in that respect, right? We are all part of, of one family. And that's really part of, of, of the message here that is uh, carried in this case by Holocaust museums, but and in your person, Dr. Stern, uh, but this idea of connection that we that we must prevent these kinds of, of acts from gaining purchase is so important. Uh, yes, uh, as the museum, uh, strengthen me in my conviction, which is sometimes challenged. How can you, <clears throat> with your whole family, victimized to, in fact, killed by the Nazis, how can you have an interest in German culture, in uh, having German colleagues, German students, I, I've been a guest professor many times in Germany. I even talked at the Jewish Museum once. So uh, I, I uh, found a way, uh, or let us say, I found an insight. The insight is that you must not make sweeping judgments about any group. With any group, there are the three, uh, the three uh, type of people that we saw in Nazi Germany. One was the uh, uh, was act actively the perpetrators. The second one was the unconcerned bystander. And the uh, last one were the few, far too few altruists who actually tried to help uh, the oppressed. And that division still holds. And I think we have to not use mass judgments on a people, on a society, even on a small group living in the same village. They are divided. I serve the Holocaust Museum here in the capacity of being the director of the Institute of the Righteous, in short, of altruism, St both studying the cause or the internal causes, the psychology of making an altruist and also to, to spread that sentiment of unselfish, even sometimes sacrificial service uh, among high school students. So that is our mission here at the Holocaust Museum. And I think to do otherwise is really furthering the ideology of uh, of the Nazis, the fascists, who would say all the Jews uh, are, there's another Goebbels quote, uh, are the despoilment of, of German society and uh, other niceties that had were said at the time. So we're going to, we're going to go to uh, Ellie, Dr. Wenzel, and then um, 
uh, you, Dr. Stern, um, I wanted to mention um, two polls that we that we had. The one that we're doing right now is, is interesting and just opposed to the previous one. There was an opposition to uh, suppression of speech as a route to uh, address this issue. Right. So in other words, while some of this speech that is being promoted through social media is doing harm. There is a real opposition in this poll to cracking down on any speech, in other words, stopping speech. But accountability, accountability for speech and countering speech with other speech was, was very much uplifted. Now, there's another, the second poll was very interesting in that over 50% 50 of the people who are responding are saying that social media companies are actually very responsible for this and and um, and the the issue needs to be addressed by addressing this social media push of hate speech out over truth speech. So how do we deal with this? Uh, uh, I'm going to go to uh, Ellie, uh, Dr. Wenzel, because this is an international problem of hate speech. What we're seeing in Myanmar in pushing hate speech is no different than what we saw in, thir in the 30s, and it's no different than we see in any other country. Um, I couldn't in Rwanda. It, right? or, or Rwanda or whatever. How do we deal with this issue of, of social media companies being able to monetize and basically make more profit in this way? Because it's very, sim it's very similar to the profit that was made by filmmakers, black and white filmmakers, and radio um, stations in Nazi Germany. So, so I know that Germany has a different uh, set of, of, of basic constitution in the United States that's here. Our First Amendment really does limit the ability of the government to act here, but these are private companies and they do not have to keep everything on their platform. They have no obligation to. And uh, given the amount of profit, as you're saying, that they are earning, um, I've read quite a bit that they are not spending enough money hiring people, human beings, not just AI, uh, some, as the survey was talking about, but human beings who speak the language natively of their posters to review these and to remove posts that are uh, inciting hate. That's so a people like Dr. Job. Stern in his day as a Ritchie boy, where the Ritchie boys developed 60% of the actionable intelligence for D-Day. So people... They spoke the Dr. language. Stern. They spoke the language as locals. It isn't like someone who took high school German. Uh, in fact, there were a couple of, of Richie boys who got trained who spoke la the language because they took high school German. They did not have the same success. Um, it, this, is, this is work that um, these companies can afford to do, given the profit they're making from these, uh, from these viewers. And they need to hire more individuals who speak these languages natively so they can remove the hate speech. It's work, but it's work they can afford to do. That would make a difference. And they really should be obligated to do it out of a moral stance. And I, I hope they are embarrassed into it. Dr. Wenzel, how, do, how does the view look from Germany? You have a different set of, of laws that are informed by the experience that you have. How does Germany look at this issue of speech and ensuring that we have free speech that is requirement for a democracy, but also um, that, that uh, we don't have this vehicle for promoting uh, hate within society? Um, well, first of all, it's interesting for me to discuss this question with you because, you know, the, the idea of um, what should be published um, after the World War was, uh, was pretty much, there was censorship by the U.S. Army. And, um, and we still have a lot of uh, things that are censored um, not being distributed from Nazi times by the U.S. Army, um, which are not being distributed, but now you find it on YouTube. <laughs> um, um, so, but it, you can't officially. So, so there was an idea how a media um, can work towards a democratic society. And that idea was imposed by the U.S. in, in Germany. And, that's, and, and now there is this kind of shift, which is really disturbing, um, um, that this idea is lost. Which kind of speech and which kind of exchange is, you know, um, 
is democratic one and which is hate speech and which is like undermining democratic values. And I think there, there needs to be a very clear definition. And this is where your friction needs to come in because um, hate speech needs to be um, uh, put under your friction. There is new laws in Germany for that. Also, um, when it comes to social media, that you can, um, and new um, um, NGOs uh, coming up that help you um, when you are in a shit storm and, and so under, and, and when you are under hate speech. And so, so as a matter of fact, you know, the idea of freedom of speech is a lot used to promote hate speech. And um, I totally agree with what Eli said. It's, it's very easy to draw the line. Um, um, and um, the fact that social media platforms are promoting, you know, emotions, aggression, and uh, this form of, of hate speech that is undermines our democratic values is a, a, a very serious threat. And so um, the companies need to take a stand and need to be made responsible for that. So, Dr. Stern, um, you have the most experience of all of us in this well. issue of, of speech and, and where the balance should be. And, and it's, it's just an open-ended question. I don't have any idea how you'll, how you'll answer this. Do you believe that, that there needs to be um, some sort of accountability for promoting um, real untruths and hate and those kinds of things? Yes, uh, the, uh, uh, this is really how do we counter the big lie is the question. The big lie technique, uh, yes. yes. We in the United States are way behind. Uh, we uh, didn't use propaganda in the, in the First World War. Uh, Wilson was put down by his defense secretary uh, who said, well, what do you want us to do? Read other people's mail? And uh, <laughs> which uh, is part of, uh, part of your job to figure out your enemy. I, I think uh, as we, I have, what did England do? In England, uh, during uh, World War II, uh, Churchill had the good sense to appoint a man of high intellectual uh, reputation, a scholar, uh, Seth Delma was his name, and uh, uh, he was able to, being both in psychology and various other disciplines, he was able to guide us uh, by his writings, and we need for uh, for uh, uh, our own, we need a Sefton Delmer in Washington. We need experts, and uh, they can guide us how to best uh, approach the enemy. And that these are our enemies, the ones who want to undermine democracy and to uh, put in place something. My own experience is when I dealt uh, with German prisoners, with German, later with the German occupation, uh, our occupation of Germany, uh, when we dealt with that, uh, we we're trying to put it on a personal basis, giving personal examples. And I think these were some of the most effective things because with persons, most uh, people can identify. If you talk in, a, in abstractions, and we are, all, I, we are given to that, and I hear it uh, sometimes on television broadcasts where people with their high intellectual qualifications lose themselves and talk at the level of theirs, but they should be talking, they should be knowing their audience. That can 
be achieved by giving personal anecdotes, personal experiences. And that's one of the things that I advocate uh, in our fight against the big lie. Here, here. I think I think you are all saying that uh, you've all expressed confidence. If you take a look at the three groups that uh, Dr. Stern mentioned, those people, the small group that are uh, collaborators and push these ideas of, of, of lies and hate, then you have a massive group of people who are sitting in the middle and, and a small group of people who are the righteous, who counter. Yes. What, what you're saying is that every one of those people can, can shift over toward uh, defending democracy. And, and what you're saying, Dr. Stern, I think is so important. We should not be reluctant to say that hate is not part of democracy. We should not be reluctant to say that lies are not part of democracy. And we should not be reluctant to gird ourselves for battle in defense of democracy. I'd like to thank you all, Rabbi Ellie Meyerfeld, CEO of the Holocaust Memorial Center of Michigan, Dr. Guy Stern, former interim director of the Center Scholar of German Languages and Culture and former U.S. Army Ritchie boy, <laughs> service in World War II, and Professor Dr. Mirjam um, Wenzel, director of the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt. Thank you so much. Thank your staffs. Thank your boards. And, and thank you in person. I, I will give you uh, all a call, uh, starting with Dr. Wenzel, given the, the, uh, the time difference. Uh, but we really appreciate your sharing your experiences uh, with us. It is, it is so wonderful to see you all today. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Mark. This Thank has been really you. enjoyable. And those of you who are in driving distance, we invite you to come to the museum to learn these lessons. And the same for Dr. Vince will come in. You should and, when you're, and when you're in Frankfurt, you absolutely <laughs> exactly. have to go to the Jewish Museum in Frankfurt. Exactly.